Well, good morning. It's wonderful to see you in God's house today. Tomorrow we celebrate Veterans Day. So in honor of all our veterans, when you hear your service hymn sung, would you stand please and let us say thank you for your service. served in our armed forces, we are so incredibly grateful for you and grateful to God Almighty that we live in a country that is free, that we get to gather in worship today. So we're glad you're here. If you're visiting with us for the first time, we would love it if you would fill out the card that's in the pew in front of you that says guest. 
um, and you can put that in the offering plate, and we would love to have a record of your visit. Um, if you have something on your heart, anyone that you that we can be praying with you about this week, please fill out the prayer card. You can also put that in the offering, or you can um, you can take either one of those cards and put, turn them in in the welcome center as well. But as a staff, we commit to be praying with you about anything that is on your heart this week. Also, if you have a praise um, and have seen the Lord answer one of your requests, we would love it if you would. Um, share that with us as well. So you're about to get to see some of the cutest kids in the country. But first, welcome somebody around you with a happy Sunday. Thanks. You be seated for just a second.
Just wait. 
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we come and we bow before you, uh, just thanking you for, for making all things new. Your word teaches us that, that if we're in Christ, we are new creations. And so we thank you and we praise you for that today. And we thank you for the opportunity we have to come and sing and fellowship and open your word and worship together, all because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And I thank you for those men and women that stood, uh, those veterans that are in our midst today. We thank you for their service and the sacrifices that they made to ensure that, that many across this country and around this world have freedom and enjoy that today. And so I pray that we would worship in that, serve in that, and live in the freedom that we have in Christ and here in this world. Pray that as we give back a portion of what you've given to us so freely and abundantly, I pray that you would use these offerings to further the name of Jesus in this church, in this community, and beyond as we seek to be obedient to you. We give this time to you and we pray in your son's name. Amen. Good morning. 
It's great to see everybody today. I, I know several of you have commented on the fact that I'm wearing glasses. I just woke up this morning, my contacts were bothering me, so I wore these, and several of you said it makes me look smarter. Well, you know, <laughs> appearances can be deceiving. We'll see about that. But uh, it reminds me of the story of the guy who was sitting in his living room, and uh, he was reading one of those men's magazines, and he said out loud to his wife, can you believe this? This magazine asked me if I'd be willing to give up 20 IQ points if I could look like Brad Pitt. And I said, that's ridiculous. I, I, you know, I, I'm not nearly that shallow. And the wife didn't even look up from her magazine. She said, well, you could at least think about it. <laughs> so, Psalm 124. We're in Psalm 124 and 126 today. And I don't know if y'all are familiar with, there was a mini-series uh, in the early 90s on CBS called Lonesome Dove. Any Lonesome Dove fans here? Okay. So I know that series so well, I could quote it basically from end to end. And I can do all the accents and everything. My wife and daughter think that's just wonderful. They love that. But um, that's called sarcasm. So um, if you haven't seen it, it's the story of these two legendary Texas Rangers named Gus and Woodrow. Um, and they have gotten old, and they are off on one last big adventure before they have to take up the rocking chair. Uh, and in this one scene, Gus and Woodrow walk into a saloon in San Antonio, this place they used to be well-known. In fact, their picture's still on the wall behind the bar, but the bartender doesn't recognize them, and he yells at them for bringing in dust into the saloon. And so Gus gets mad, and he whacks him across the face, and he hits him with his Colt revolver, and, and they have to run and, and skedaddle because the law is on the way for, to arrest them for assault. And as they're riding out of town, Gus says to Woodrow, and I had to look this up, I had to write it down just right. The reason they don't remember us is we never got killed. If a thousand Comanches had cornered us in some gully somewhere and wiped us out like the Sioux just done Custer, why, they'd remember us, sure. Heck, they'd be writing songs about us for a hundred years. And I, I say that because we're talking about a, two psalms today that talk about God as our rescuer. We are in a series about the Psalms of Ascent, that section of the Psalms from 120 to 134, 15 Psalms that the Israelites used to sing three times a year when they were on their way to Jerusalem for the three big pilgrimage festivals. And as they would walk in community together, they would sing these songs over and over again. These were their songs of ascent. They were walking toward Zion, towards Jerusalem, ascending up the hill the incline toward the house of God. And we want to we know how we can connect with God more fully in worship, how we can know Him better, not just on Sunday mornings, not just making Sunday morning more meaningful, but every day of your life connecting with Him and knowing Him and hearing His voice. So the reason I told you that story at the beginning is God wants us to remember Him. He wants us to remember our rescue that He Himself did for us. Not because he's like Gus in the story. He's not insecure. He doesn't need to be affirmed. God doesn't want us to remember him because he needs to be remembered. He wants us to remember him because we need to remember. We need to recall what God has done for us. In these two Psalms, we're going to see how remembering our salvation, remembering what God saved us from and what he's done for us since, makes all the difference in us becoming the people we were created to be. So let's look at 124 first, and then we'll talk about that, and then we'll talk about 126, and then we'll talk about two points of application, two things that you and I need to do in order to grow into the people we need to be, to connect with God and become who we're called to be. Psalm 124 says, if the Lord had not been our if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel not say. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side when people rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us his prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And we don't know the specific event that Psalm 124 is talking about when it talks about the things we've escaped from, the things that God has rescued us from. Some people think it's talking about the parting of the Red Sea in the book of Exodus because it mentions raging waters. But there are a, a large number of, I mean, there's any number of stories it could be talking about. If you've read the Old Testament at all, you know there's a number of times in Israel's history 
when God intervened in a, in a spectacular way, when he did something that everyone looked and saw, oh, that had to be God. So just to give you three examples, in 2 Kings 6, the army of the enemy is camped around the city where Elisha the prophet is, and he prays, and the army is struck blind. Imagine an entire army struck blind, and Elisha himself goes out and leads them by the hand into the city of Samaria where they are summarily captured by the Israelites. Next chapter in 2 Kings 7, there's a story of the, the army of the enemy camping, actually laying siege to the city of Samaria, the capital of Israel. And so this city, the, the, the people of God are inside. They're starving to death because they can't get food. They can't get provisions because this siege is outside their walls. And God causes that army outside to hear the sound of chariots and horses thundering across the plains. And they assume that the Israelites have hired reinforcements. They get afraid and they flee for their lives. They leave behind their clothes, their food, their provisions. So the starving city has food. And then my favorite, this is a very little-known story, uh, 2 Chronicles 20, King Jehoshaphat is about to fight a battle against the enemy, and it's actually three armies faced against him, three different nations in a coalition against the people of God, and Jehoshaphat has, a, has an interesting strategy. He calls the choir of God to walk before the army. So this choir of Levites goes out marching, singing in front of the army with their weapons. And when the, the foreign troops hear the sound of the praises of God, they panic and turn on each other. And these three armies decimate each other. And so when the army of God gets there, there's nothing but dead bodies. So that's just three examples. There's all kinds of stories like that in the Old Testament. And, and when, they're taught, when they're singing in, in chapter 124, in Psalm 124, they could be talking about any one of those that I've just mentioned or any others. But I want you to notice, it says, let Israel now say, if the Lord had not been on our side. You know what that is? That's, that's a direction to the song leader. You know, these were hymns to be sung in Israelite worship. That was a direction to the song leader to essentially put your hand to your ear and say, I can't hear you. If the Lord had not been on our side, now come on, come on, Israel, sing. This is like Robert standing here and stopping the song in mid-song and saying, is that all you're going to do? Is that how you're going to sing? Come on. Do you mean this or not? Let's sing loud. Let's start it over again. Let Israel now say. He wanted them to remember. He wanted them to get excited about their rescue. You know, I grew up in the church. I'm one of those kids, like a lot of you, who I was in church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, unless I was deathly ill. I was there. I, my, my mom made sure my bedtime stories were Bible stories. Believe me, I heard the gospel again and again and again growing up. And I, I got saved when I was nine. I dedicated my life to the Lord when I was 16. Believe me, I was sincere in my faith. And yet, it always bothered me growing up and even into my young adulthood that the gospel was supposed to be good news. And the preachers, all my preachers and Bible teachers talked like, boy, we should be so excited about the good news. And yet I knew deep down in my heart, there were a lot of things I was a lot more excited about than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that bothered me. Was there something wrong with me? And I think part of it was I had grown up around it. I had heard it all my life. I sort of took for granted. Sure, God loves me. Yeah, Jesus died for me. Of course he did. That's what I'd been told. But imagine being someone in the ancient world. Imagine being one of these people who grew up in a society where you just, your, your very survival counted on, will the gods be on our side or not? Do you know that archaeologists have, have found uh, villages from before the Israelites inhabited Palestine? And they found homes, m many of those homes, there would be a, a, a tiny skeleton in the walls. Because when families would build a house, they would often sacrifice one of their children and build it into the wall of the house. Because they thought that's what it takes to make sure the gods will be on our side. Can you imagine? And for the Israelites to come along and say, we know God's on our side. The Lord is on our side. Beth Moore, in talking about this psalm, says that it ought to be a reminder to people like me, and probably like a lot of you, who got saved early on in life, it ought to be a reminder that we need to sit down and just say, Lord, where would I be without you? We need to take score. We need to, we need to write down an account. Lord, here's what would my life would be if you weren't on my side. If, if you didn't exist or if you existed but you were against me or if I just didn't know about you, if I didn't have you fighting for me, where would I be? 
And she tells a little of her story. She, she was abused as a young girl. And, and then later on, even as a Christian young woman, she believed that she was destined to be a prosecuting attorney. Her, her heart's desire was, I want to grow up and put people in jail who hurt people like someone hurt me. And she said, if I would have followed that path, I would have been such a bitter person. I would have gone around with what I thought was righteous indignation, but really would have been bitterness. I would have been putting people in jail, no matter whether they were innocent or not. If they were accused, I would have wanted them to go to jail. It would have poisoned all my relationships. It would have poisoned my spirit. I would have hated men, but at the same time, I would have needed their validation. So I would have, I would have been gone through toxic relationship after toxic relationship, probably multiple divorces. But instead, the Lord came along and set me on a different trajectory. And you have a story like that too, if the Lord is your God. You have a story of, here's who I would be, and yet Jesus came in and sent me on this different direction. And even if you got saved when you were in elementary school, you can look and you can say, here are the things that are true in me only because of Jesus. Not because I was raised by good parents, even though I was. Not because I married the right person, even though I did. Because of Jesus, this, these are the things that are true in my life. These are the things He rescued me from. And if you got saved later in life, it's easier for you to write that story. But what I'm saying to you is this week, spend 30 minutes, spend an hour, just schedule out some time to sit down and get out a piece of paper and say, if the Lord were not on my side, here are the things that would be true in my life. And it'll, it'll fill you with gratitude and joy. So let's look at Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. So in 126, the context is more obvious. We are pretty sure we know what he's talking about. So years after those stories I told you about earlier, the people of God, there was only one little tribe left, the tribe of Judah. The Israelites themselves, the northern kingdom of Israel, had been conquered, dispossessed by the Assyrians 150 years earlier. But now Judah remained of the people of God. They were the only ones. And they were invaded and conquered by Babylon. The walls of the city were crushed and the, the temple was burned and the people were deported. Those who didn't die in the invasion were deported to the distant kingdom of Babylon, a place where they worshipped different gods, where they spoke a different language, where they had radically different values. And if it was like any other nation, that would have been the end of the Jews. We would only read about them in history books. But 70 years later, at the decree of Cyrus, the emperor of Persia, they were set free. In fact, better than set free. They were given money from the Persian treasury. Go, rebuild your walls, rebuild your temple, worship your God, inhabit your nation again. And that's what it's talking about in 126 when it says, we were like those who dream. Have you ever experienced something so unexpected, so wonderful, that you said to yourself, am I dreaming? Is this real? I, I just can't believe this could have actually happened. And when he says, in the nations they were saying, the Lord has done great things for them, you hear what he's saying, right? The word nation and the word Gentile is the same word in the Hebrew language. He's saying all the Gentiles, all the non-believers were saying their God has shown up for them. Do you know why? Well, let me, let me put it to you this way. When's the last time you saw an Assyrian? I don't mean Assyrian, an Assyrian. They were, big they were a big deal 3,000 years ago in the Middle East. They were the big shots. They're gone. They haven't been seen in three millennia. When's the last time you talked to a Babylonian or a Phoenician or a Philistine or a Hittite, for goodness sakes? Edomites and Moabites and all those otherites. I mean, they're all over the Scriptures. They were all over the Middle East 3,000 years ago, and none of them exist today. Not even their descendants. You know why? Because in the ancient world, when your country got conquered, you ceased to exist as a people. You were either killed or you assimilated into the country that, that conquered you. You worshipped their gods, you spoke their language, you married their children, and you became one of them. And that's what should have happened to Israel, but the Lord was on their side. Do you know that the book of Romans says 
that God has a plan for the Jewish people even in the end times. There's going to be a great turning of Israel back to the Lord through Jesus Christ, their Messiah, and we look forward to that. But if you ever want objective evidence that the God of the Bible is the one true God, ask yourself the question, why do the Jews still exist? I mean, how many different nations have tried to wipe those people out? And they haven't been able to succeed because the Lord God has protected them, because God has them on His heart. And that's what, the, that's what the author of Psalm 126 is saying. All the nations were amazed. How can these people still be alive? How can they still worship their God? How can they inhabit their nation and rebuild their temple? God must be on their side. Their God must be the true God. And yet, look at verse 4. Like so many of the Psalms, Psalm 126 is two very distinct halves. The first half is all about remembering and rejoicing, but but verse 4 says, Restore our fortunes, O Lord. You hear what he's saying? That was great, Lord. Look what you did. But we're 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 in a bind again. I like the way Eugene Peterson paraphrases it. He says, verse 4, And now, God, do it again. You did it once. Now we need you to show up again. What it's saying is we're in a time of desert. We remember when things were beautiful and, and blossoming, and now everything's dead around us, and, and we're starving, and we're thirsting, and Lord, we need you to pour out your rain upon us again. It, it talks about streams in the Negev. The Negev is the desert region of Judah. You know what happens when there's rain in the desert? Have you ever seen this? So in the desert, when rain hits, when there's a big rain, the seeds that have been laying dormant for years suddenly germinate, and you wake up the next morning, and the desert is full of flowers and full of blooms. And that's what the psalmist is saying, Lord, bring us back to life. Can any of you resonate with that? I don't need an amen. You you don't have to testify publicly, but I I bet at least a third of you, maybe half of you, maybe even more than that, would say, yeah, right now I'm struggling. Right now... I'm just barely hanging on. I need the Lord to show up. I need the Lord to deliver me. I need to be rescued. So what do we do? What what do these two psalms tell us about how to connect with God when we're in that desert time and what it means to remember our rescue? Two things we take from this. Number one, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. And I want to tell you what I don't mean first off, okay? Because there's a school of thought within Christianity today, especially American Christianity, that says that our responsibility, if we want a good life, if we want the life we've always wanted, then we need to go out and claim the promises that God has given us. We need to claim our victory. So if your marriage is struggling, you say, Lord, I I just claim that you're going to bring my husband back to me. Lord, I claim that you're going to make my wife love me. My kids are off the rails. Lord, I I just cast out the demons that are in them, and I say, put them back on track. And if I'm sick, I, you know, the, I, just, I just claim Isaiah 53, by your wounds I am healed. Lord, I just claim victory over my illness. And if I'm broke, I just, I just tell God, you just open those storehouses in heaven and pour down your blessings upon me. And I wait for it to happen because if I have enough faith, he's going to give me everything that I ask for and more. He will not let me down. He will not thwart my expectations because I'm his beloved child Thank you for not amening any of that. Because there are definitely scriptures you can take out of context to make it sound like that's the way the Christian life is supposed to work. But I've got a problem with that idea. And that is when you read the entire Bible, you see none of God's people lived that way. Jesus didn't live that way. Paul didn't live that way. You ever read 2 Corinthians chapter 11? I highly recommend you do, especially after you've listened to one of these guys on television or or in the radio or in their own church. Read 2 Corinthians 11 as Paul lists his list of his sufferings, what he has suffered for the sake of Christ. And you say to yourself, man, that's an impressive list. And remember, those are all the things that happened to him after he believed in Jesus. He had it pretty good before that. He was a superstar before that. And then things went south once he followed Christ. From an earthly perspective, is that because Paul's faith was too weak? Is that because Paul was not a good enough person to claim the victory that Christ has purchased for him? I bet most of the rest of the apostles had a similar list. In fact, most of the early Christians did. 
They either suffered a martyr's death or they were close to someone who did suffer a martyr's death. Think about Christians today in China, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Cuba, places where the gospel is under fire, places where if you have a church that's not registered with the state, it's very likely they'll come and bulldoze your building and put your pastor in jail. If Places where if you come to know Christ and renounce your former faith, your family disowns you and might try to kill you. Places like that, are those Christians less faithful than us because they're suffering? Well, I bet their faith would put us to shame. So, do not for a second believe that trusting in the Lord means you get everything you want. Does God show up and work miracles in your life? I believe He does. But does He do everything you ask Him to do? Sure doesn't for me. And I thank God for that. Because what trust in the Lord means is that you believe that He actually knows better than you what you actually need. Now, like the way Tim Keller puts it, he says, when we pray, God answers every prayer the way we would if we knew what He knows. Let me say that again a different way. God answers every prayer you pray the way you would if you knew what He knows. There are a couple of analogies that help me understand this. One of them, when I was a seminary student, we had a class, uh, the beginning of a class period, we were opening in prayer as we often did, and a a member of the class raised his hand and asked for prayer. There was a teenage boy that he wanted us to pray for, and then he told us a story. He said, this boy uh, is dating, or was dating my teenage daughter. Now, this guy was in his 40s, which made him ancient compared to us because we were all in our early 20s. Um, He said, this guy had been dating my daughter. My wife and I knew it wasn't a healthy relationship, so we made her break it off, but he didn't take it well. He, he began to stalk my daughter. He began to uh, basically just torment her. And uh, last night, I, was, I looked out my window, and I saw him sitting in his car in front of our house, just sitting there, as if to say, you can't get rid of me. And so I went out there. Now, every member of that class was like me, 22, 23 years old. We were barely older than that boy. In fact, I'd be willing to bet some of the guys in that room had been a teenage idiot like that right? And yet, every single one of us, you could tell, you could just feel it in the air. Every single one of us were thinking, okay, okay, this boy's about to get a daddy beat down. Because there's a a very specific rage that comes into a father of a daughter. You know, he can be 5'2 and 110 pounds, and he's a fearsome thing to behold when his daughter is in trouble. So we're thinking, okay, daddy's about to put a whooping on this boy, and we're here for it. We want to hear about this. And I'm sure that's what that dad was thinking too. But he tells us, I found myself sitting in that car next to him and just talking to him. I ended up leading him to give his life to the Lord in that car last night. And so I'm just pray- I just want us to pray that he would follow through on that commitment and would become a new person in Christ and that he would get the support he needs so he could live the life that God called him to live. And we were just blown away. That was not the way we thought that story was going to end. And I always think about that when I think about enemies because we as Christians, we know that the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and leave room for the wrath of God, and and we can love our enemies because God's got our back. And I think what we're thinking sometimes is, well, God, how come my enemies are still prospering and I'm suffering? How come I'm crying and he's laughing? How come you haven't come down and crushed him like a bug? Because he deserves it. And what we don't realize is, yes, God is a God of vengeance and wrath and justice will be done. But you know, God would certainly rather take the justice upon himself. He would rather see that enemy of ours repent and be saved than have to be punished. See, God answers every prayer the way we we would if we knew what he knows. Far, far better for our enemies to come to know Christ and become new people. We're looking for vengeance, and God is looking for salvation. Here's another analogy. When we had our firstborn child, no one told me that someday I was going to have to hold this child that I love and hold them still while a doctor inserted a needle into her arm. And as she cried and stared at me and wondered why I was doing what I was doing, I didn't know that was going to be part of my job as a dad. And first first time kid, you know, you get, you get kind of jaded later on, but first time kid, I, was think, I thought I need to be at every appointment. Well, one time I had to miss. 
And Carrie came home and she said, boy, you picked the wrong one to miss. They gave her three shots and they had to burn her umbilical cord off of her stomach because it won't fall off on its own. And she said, that was awful. And I'm sure if our daughter had been able to speak then, she would have said to us, you know, if you really loved me, you wouldn't let this happen. If you really love me, you would protect me from those evil men and the evil things they do to me because it hurts. And we could have explained to her, sweetie, it's because we love you that we're doing this. And it makes me think. It made me think back then. See, I wonder how often God thinks that way about me. Since He loves me and He loves you even more than we love our own children, think about how much it hurts God to watch us go through pain. Think about how much He agonizes to watch us suffer and struggle. And yet, if He could explain to us, if we had ears to hear, if we were capable of understanding, He would show us, here's why this must happen now. Here's why this hasn't ended yet. Here's what I have in mind. Yes, I could intervene, but I haven't. And here's why. You have to trust me. You have to trust me. There's another thing. Another thing we need to learn. Sow gospel seed. S-O-W, sow gospel seed. I love the end of chapter 126. Those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the, sowed for, the seed for sowing, will come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. But that doesn't mean what I used to think it means. I used to think it just meant, you know, this too shall pass. Things are bad now, but they're going to be better later. That's not really comforting, is it? In fact, you don't even have to believe in God to believe that. It's saying something much more wonderful. It's saying... Not only is God going to make things better for you, not only is God going to bring joy into your sadness, He is going to use your sadness to bring you joy. He is going to work your suffering into victory. Someday you're going to look back and rejoice that you went through those dark times. You're going to be glad you went through the desert because God used it. See, Derek Kidner wrote a commentary on the Psalms, and he pointed out that in the New Testament, it's common, it's common for the New Testament to talk about how suffering actually is a benefit to us, that we're to rejoice in our moments of suffering because God uses them to develop us. And that's not something you see in the Old Testament because, you know, 2 Corinthians 4.17 is just one example. For our light momentary afflictions are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs them all. Only Paul could call our sufferings light and momentary and get away with it. But he's right. Kidner points out, this is the only place in the Old Testament where that is explicitly taught. What he's saying is, your seeds of tears, your gospel tears, are going to produce joy later on. What do I mean by gospel tears? When we're not just weeping over our circumstances, when we're not just feeling sorry for ourselves, when we're not just saying, Lord, when are you going to show up and deliver me? But we're actually weeping tears of repentance then God is planting seeds that lead to change in our lives. And I've got a perfect example in my own life. 27 years ago, newly married, I was struggling. I was struggling to be a good husband. I was struggling in every part of my life. Nothing was working out the way I thought it would. And granted, I was 22 years old, so I was immature, and I had a tendency to make things worse than they really were. But I remember several times in, there, in that period of life praying and saying, Lord, if this is the way it's going to be, just kill me now. I don't want to live this way. You know, drop a piano on me. Strike me with lightning. Let a bus hit me. Or just let me not wake up tomorrow because I don't want to live this way. And in the midst of that time, I remembered thinking, because I'd heard that cliche, you never know that Jesus is all you need until he's all you have. And so I decided to put that to the test. And I started just reading the Bible. I didn't know what else to do. Instead of just reading a chapter a day, as had been my practice for the last couple of years, I actually just started reading when I would have been watching TV. And then it got to be, I started reading when I should have been sleeping. I just couldn't get enough of the Word of God. Suddenly I had this insatiable hunger for it. And in the midst of that time, God took me and, and set me on a different trajectory. He said, you thought that you wanted to do this and be this, but I don't want to go there with you. I want you to go here. And I went on that def different trajectory, and I, I look at how God, I mean, not that I've been perfect since then, but I, I look at how God changed me. Those, those tears that I wept back then weren't just tears that said, Lord, why am I in such a bad position? They were tears that said, Lord, why am I such a selfish person that I can't love this woman you've given me? Why am I such a, a, a temperamental person that I can't be a good witness to my unchristian boss? Why am, I, why am I this way, Lord, with all that I've been given? Why do I still have so many sins in my life? I was weeping gospel tears because they were tears of repentance. And now I look back, and when I look back at those days, man, it's still painful to think about, 
But I thank God for that time. Because of those tears, they brought me joy. They brought flowers into my desert. Flowers that are still blooming and increasing. One thing I learned during that time was that most of my sorrows were my own fault, a result of my own immaturity. And I'm not saying your pain today is your fault because not all pain is directly attributed to some sin you've committed, but I am saying we cannot afford to waste those times in the desert. Don't miss that. Don't miss it by just sitting around thinking about when is this going to stop. Don't miss the opportunity to say, Lord, search me and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way that is everlasting. Ask the Lord to bring you flowers in the wilderness once again, to bring streams into your desert. So I don't know what you get from these two psalms, but if you're in a desert right now, will you dare to trust Him? Will you dare to say, Lord, I want you to get me out of this, and I'm looking forward to it, and I believe you will, but in the meantime, help me to trust you and to walk in joy in spite of my pain. And if you're like me, because right now things are really great for me, and I'm sure they are for many of you, if you're going through a time of, of blossoming and blooming and joyfulness, then why not sit down and just say, Lord, if you had not been on my side, where would I be? And really take some time to rejoice over the changes God has made in your life and the new trajectory He has placed you on and the fruits of that victory. Either way, remember your rescue. Remember it every day because it will save you again and again. Let's pray. Lord God, we're so grateful. Lord, every good thing that we have is from You. And most of all, Lord, our salvation. Our salvation comes from You. Our salvation is not just the day we prayed the prayer of salvation. Our salvation is not just the day we got baptized. Our salvation is not just the fact that we know we're forgiven and we get to go to heaven when we die. Lord, You have saved us not just from hell, but You've saved us from ourselves. You've saved us from the the path that we were on, from the trajectory our life would have taken. So help us to remember. To take note of all the things You have rescued us from. Lord, I pray Your Holy Spirit would just show us things that maybe we haven't even thought about before. Decisions we would have made. Traps we would have fallen into if You had not been on our side. And Lord, I pray specifically for the people here this morning who are struggling, who are limping, who are just thirsting for You. Help them to see You are on their side and You will get them through. Help them to trust you in the midst of this. Help us to support them as we should. For it's in the name of Christ Jesus we pray all these things. Amen. See, what this sermon is really saying is turn your eyes upon Jesus. That, that, that's how things get clear. The things of this world will become clear in the light of his glory and grace. Let's stand and let's sing that song together. You come if God's laid on your heart a decision you need to make to follow Christ, to join our church. But let's sing together as we close. Oh
thank you again for being here this morning. Just a reminder uh, from inside the worship guide at first uh, from Pastor Jeff Snow, be sure you're praying this week that the Holy Spirit uh, would help you, help us to see uh, where we'd be without Him and that we would rejoice in Christ, uh, no matter our circumstances. Let that be our prayer as a church family uh, this week as we go from this place. Hope you have plans to stay for Life Group on your way there. Uh, or after Life Group, you'll see two things that you can do in the atrium today. One is there's a group of men in our church who have a ministry uh, for discipleship and outreach called One to One. Uh, they've got a table as well as a TV with a video scrolling about what they do and who they are. And there'll be some people from that ministry there. So you can visit with them about that. And then just behind where they are, along the wall underneath where the all-in table has been for most of the year, are all the cartons, 640 plus boxes for Operation Christmas Child, seeds of the gospel that are going to be planted in hearts and minds all over the world. And so we want to ask you today and throughout the course of this week as you're on our campus, stop by there and pray over those boxes that God would use them uh, to further his kingdom. And if you're still holding on to a box that isn't filled up, you've got one week uh, to turn it in because next Sunday afternoon, early part of the week after next, they're going to be back load those up onto a trailer uh, and take them to their delivery spot. So we want to be praying for those before they go. And then the last reminder about tonight, 4.30 in the gym, our Thanksgiving meal as a church family, opportunity to hear about and thank God for some things that have happened in missions over the course of this past year. I do have one very important reminder. Uh, many of you have stepped up to bring a side dish or a dessert. If you've done that, please bring something to serve that with. We don't have 150 serving utensils. I'm glad that we have a combination of about 150 sides and desserts coming, but bring something to serve that with. Maybe label it with your name. That way it doesn't get mixed up, but we'll be sure. We've got some volunteers to help oversee that, but we want to be sure that we can serve everybody your delicious sides and pies and cakes and other desserts this evening. So thank you all for doing that, but be sure you bring something to serve it with. On that note, let's sing out. Israel. 